So first of all, we should probably all of take a look at what some of the key amplifier specs are. So uh, these are the ones that I would consider to be the most important. Of course, how much power is there? And more power is always better, right? So you can't have too much power. Um, but the power has to be clean. So there are a couple of distortion specs that are commonly quoted. Those would be harmonic distortion and intermodulation distortion. Uh, another really important factor is the signal to noise ratio. And again, there's a lot of different ways of measuring that. And even the measurements can be somewhat misleading there. Um, and then finally, frequency response and bandwidth. You, you know, how smooth is the response? How wide is the bandwidth? Uh, we now are in the age of uh, high resolution audio. And the general feeling there is that you need uh, a bandwidth at least out to 40 kilohertz. Uh, to properly reproduce the information in, uh, in a high-res recording. So let's start with power. So power is the amount of energy transferred or converted per unit of time. So that's a part that is tricky for audio because what we're talking about is um, uh, not is how much work is being done and how quickly is that work being done. And this is where power and audio really run into a little bit of trouble because unlike, say, a light bulb, which you might have a 60-watt light bulb, it's always uh, consuming in ra 60 watts and radiating lumens. But that's not what music, music doesn't look like that. Music is really a signal that's constantly changing. So what you want is something more like a strobe light than a lamp. So that's one fundamental difference there. Yet, how do you measure a strobe light? That's very, very difficult. So generally, the first um, spec that we look at is something called continuous power. And this is the one that's the easiest one to measure because you just put a load on the amplifier, you put in a sine wave signal, and you crank it up until you start to see clipping. Then, you know, but even there, there are different ways to, uh, to look at that because the way that the, the um, power is spec'd uh, can be very different. And if you look at manufacturers' published specifications, these days they're all over the place. Now there was a time back in the 70s where the Federal Trade Commission got involved. Uh, the power ratings were so inflated and bore so little resemblance to the quality or performance of an amplifier that the Trade Commission worked with some industry standard uh, players like the International uh, High Fidelity Institute and others to come up with some specs that made a little bit more sense or at least could be compared unit to unit. So when we say continuous maximum power, it could be at clipping, it could be at 10% distortion, which is generally quite beyond clipping. It could be at rated distortion. And is that power just at a one kilohertz frequency? Or is it at 20 hertz all the way out to 20 kilohertz, which would be the power bandwidth? So there are a lot of different ways that this spec can be measured. So if something just says it's 100 watts, that is almost a meaningless spec, even if it's continuous 100 watts because you don't really know what the distortion level is at that rating. So that's one thing that when you look at a spec sheet you really need to take uh, notice of. The other thing, the other kind of power that we like to talk about, especially at NAD, is dynamic power because this is much more difficult to measure but it much more closely correlates with a musical signal and trying to reproduce that signal. So uh, there is an IHF standard for it, which is uh, a 20 millisecond burst, and then you do that a second off, and then you do another 20 millisecond burst, and that's done at one kilohertz. Um, a very short uh, burst of power like that, even if there is some distortion in it, it's very difficult to hear it. Our brain, it's not going long enough for our brain to actually determine whether it's distorted or undistorted. So that's another little twist in the, in the road here. So this is uh, an image taken from a, an AES paper that NAD produced 
back in the 80s uh, when the, the uh, power wars were raging. And we created something at that time we called the power envelope. So the idea was that you could have uh, a continuous power and then you should have at least 3 dB of headroom beyond that to allow that, that peak that you see at the, the leading edge of the waveform. So this was done, uh, we did a lot of studies. There's, uh, on the left there's uh, uh, Genesis, no reply at all. That's a, a sampling from that song. And on the right it's uh, Bruckner Symphony Number no. 4. So those are a couple of samples of music. And you can see how the music varies. There are those very, very steep peaks that are very, very momentary. Um, uh, but an amplifier should be able to reproduce them. And as we saw in this previous slide, the studies, our studies show that an amplifier's volume control, if it's set to clipping for the highest, just below clipping for the highest peaks, the average sound is much less than that. It's only about 10 to 15 percent of that. Um, so, you know, in theory, if you could have an amplifier that could do those peaks very, very well, you could have a fairly low continuous power. And that's actually uh, something that you do see in some of the more modern uh, amplifier designs. Uh, for example, uh, Dolly's new Callisto loudspeaker has an, amp uh, an amplifier that has very low continuous power and very, very high peak power. The other thing about an amplifier is that as an amplifier manufacturer, we actually never know what the load will be on that amplifier. We don't know what speaker you're going to connect to it. We don't know if it's a speaker that will have a bandwidth from 80 hertz to 10 kilohertz or a, or a truly full range speaker that can go all the way down to 20 hertz. For NAD, we've always assumed that when you buy an amplifier, you would like to reproduce all of the audible frequencies. So I'm going to use a couple of amplifier examples here just to uh, walk through what some of the specs are and, and how they can be misleading and also how they can be very informative about what an amplifier will sound like. So the first one is continuous power. And in this case, this is our NAD M32. It's a uh, direct digital amplifier. So it is uh, considered a class D amplifier but it's one that actually takes in a digital signal. So it is in essence a DAC that can directly drive a loudspeaker. Most DACs will output a couple of volts and go at line level. This is one that can output 40 or 50 or 60 volts of output and actually directly drive a speaker. Um, so it's a little bit different. In this case, we like to keep the continuous power the same at both 4 and 8 ohms. And the reason for that is that the 180 watts in, uh, in those two frequencies, it's really the current capability that's the limiting factor. So as we know, there are two components to power. One is the voltage, that's actually the, the push. And the other is the current, which is the volume of, of uh, ele electrons required uh, to keep up with that. So, uh, at 4 ohms, you'll draw twice as much current uh, for a given voltage as you will at 8 ohms. So in this case, what we're doing is we're actually setting the current as the limiting factor, and we can get 180 watts into either 4 or 8 ohms. What this means, of course, is that the voltage at 4 ohms will be less than the voltage at 8 ohms, but the current will be the same, and thus the power is the same. Now, in this case, we're specifying it 20 to 20 kilohertz, both channels driven at rated distortion. So this is the most difficult, most explicit way of uh, expressing continuous power. So if you look at a spec, spec sheet and it just says 180 watts and no qualifiers, it doesn't mean too much because that 180 watt at rated distortion 20 to 20 K might only be uh, 120 watts because at, if you go above 120 your, your distortion goes above rated distortion. A lot of amplifier companies will spec distortion at minus 3 dB power which is basically half the power. So you have to be kind of careful what you're looking at there. Um, we also have uh, THD 20 to 20 K 
And this is a very, very clean amplifier. So what we're saying is from 250 milliwatts all the way up to rated power, we will have less than 0.005%, which is a very, very clean amplifier. But, you know, there's a lot of really great sounding amplifiers that don't have this very, very low distortion. And I'll get into that, why that is, in a, a little bit later in the presentation. Signal to noise ratio is another one. Now, what we've always done with, uh, with our amplifiers is we rate it at one watt of output. Because that is really a much more realistic, correlates better with what we hear. Um, if you do it to rated power, you're going to uh, distort that uh, figure because uh, it'll look a, like a better figure, but it's me less meaningful. What you really want is very low noise at the average power levels that you're listening. And as I mentioned, we typically only use 10% of the power uh, to reproduce at the maximum capability of the amplifier. So. In this case, the 180 watt amplifier, your typical power usage, your continuous power, is going to be more like about 10 to 15 watts. Uh, and so you're listening way down at a much lower power output level. So we do it at one watt. If it was at 10 watts, you'd have uh, a little bit better spec, but it wouldn't be as meaningful. There's also weighting. A weighted actually limits the bandwidth, so it ignores the, uh, the very low frequencies, which is where a lot of noise creeps in in an amplifier. Um, so low frequency noise is primarily uh, related to the power supply and how well the 60 hertz signal is filtered out of the power supply. Uh, the higher frequency noise is generally more thermal noise from the, the devices used. And that's a real problem on a class D amplifier like this. There is a lot of high very high frequency and high frequency out of band noise. And when we look at a couple of the graphs here, you can see uh, what that looks like. Um, the other thing we, we like to look at is the dynamic power. And here you can see at 8 ohms, we're 220 watts. So this would be at the 20 millisecond at 1K. This 180 watt will do 220. Into 4 ohms, it'll do 360. And into uh, 2 ohms, it will do 400 watts. And this is another area where a lot of amplifiers uh, fall down is when you go below 4 ohms. In fact, things like receivers, if you look at the typical AV receiver spec, they'll spec the power at 6 ohms. Why 6 ohms? I mean, we don't usually think of speakers as being 6 ohm. But 6 ohms is the place where you get uh, the maximum number where the voltage and the current are still uh, in proportion and uh, you can get a bigger number there. So uh, most amplifiers will have more power at 4 ohms and 6 ohms, but if you have a weak power supply, it'll start to current limit at 4 ohms and the power will actually drop. So 6 ohms is why they picked that. Um, the other interesting spec here that we spec and most others don't is uh, uh, peak current. So this is uh, a one ohm, one millisecond test that just shows how much amperage uh, is available in the power supply for very short term power. And here you can see we have 30 amperes of current, which is quite high. Um, and that is what gives it the ability to drive down into, uh, into a two ohm impedance. Now here's another, um, um, so I've been comparing here actually between the 328 and the, uh, the M32. I'm sorry if I confused you on this. Um, but the 328 is a much smaller amplifier in the NAD range. This is only a 50 watt per channel amplifier. This is a class AV amplifier. And uh, you can see that in many of the specs it's Similar, but not quite as good. THD is 0.03 uh, rather than 005. Signal to noise is 92 instead of 95, so it's 3 dB more noisy. Uh, and the um, dynamic power is less, but still impressive for a 50 watt amplifier. So here we can get uh, on 90 watts into 8 ohms, 
150 into 4 and 200 watts into 2. The peak output current is half as much. So that's kind of what you're paying for is that ability to do all of those things better. Now in terms of the price point, the 328 is a $550 integrated amplifier. The M32 is a uh, $4,000 integrated amplifier. So there's a big difference in price here, even though the specs are pretty good on both of them. The frequency response of the M32, because it's a, really a DAC, it does depend on the input frequency. So at 192 kilohertz, uh, we have a, uh, a bandwidth that extends uh, out to 96 kilohertz, the, the Nyquist field frequency for that, uh, that sampling rate. Here we just spec the frequency response as 20 to 20 K. The bandwidth here actually does go out to about uh, uh, 50 or 60 kilohertz uh, on this little amplifier. So what do these specs sound like? I mean, that's, I think, the more important thing. Is there a correlation between what we're reading on the spec sheet and what we're actually listening to? And uh, uh, there are some fairly good correlations here. So intermodulation distortion is really the one you should look at. And there's two ways that they measure it. There's the SMPTE, which is taking a, uh, a 400 hertz and a 7 kilohertz and putting those together. Um, the 7 kilohertz is uh, uh, 3 dB lower in level, though, than the 700 hertz. So that's one way of looking at it. The one that's more popular these days is the CCIR, where you put a, a, a 19 and a 20 kilohertz uh, signal and see what that looks like in, in the uh, intermodulation. So the thing about intermodulation distortion is that it creates uh, sounds in the amplifier that are not related to the music. They're intermodulation, so they, they're sums and differences of the two tones that you're reproducing. And these lead to a lot of very harsh, hard sounds. So when you're listening to an amplifier and it gets that harshness, that glaring sound to it, that edginess to it, that's intermodulation distortion. And it also has a lot to do, uh, as they're saying, with the how resolved and how stable uh, the stereo image is. So when you're getting into the really high-end amps, they almost always have very, very low IM distortion. Uh, so that's one, probably the more important one. The uh, harmonic distortion is more about the sonic signature. Like, we would call a very low distortion amplifier very neutral and very easy to match with a different variety of speakers. Um, Harmonic distortion can sound very nice and very rich. Um, a lot of people love the sound of like a triode two a tube amplifier because they actually distort quite a bit, but it's harmonically related and it just makes the instrument sound richer and, and fatter. So uh, especially in musical instrument amplifiers, like in uh, guitar amplifiers and so forth, uh, a lot of people really like these old uh, Fender uh, tube designs because they have lots of second order harmonic distortion that just gives a really nice uh, fat sound to the instrument. Uh, output noise, of course, you, the less the better. You can hear deeper into the recording uh, if you have less noise. And um, uh, those deep black silences is like having a really good contrast ratio on your video display. All the details in the blacks come out. And noise has a, uh, will mask whatever uh, information is in the recording below the noise floor. In fact, if you go to some offices now, they actually have uh, a white noise machine they, they put outside the door because when you walk by in the hallway, you can't listen to what's being said inside that room because you've got this white noise that masks all of what's going on inside the room there. So um, you want to have as little noise as possible. And generally, the way the noise is, it can be expressed is in how many microvolts of noise are present in the signal. And then that gets translated into what we were looking at before, the signal-to-noise ratio, which is 
how far below the signal is the noise. So when you're 90 dB below the signal at one watt, that's a very, very quiet uh, amplifier. Um, flat frequency response uh, unaffected by load. This is another area where some amplifiers are better than others. So in the days of tube amplifiers, uh, which are still popular with many audiophiles, you have an output transformer. And those transformers would generally have different taps for different impedances. But that really makes, a, uh, makes an amplifier with a fairly high output impedance. And as that output impedance of the amplifier gets closer to the, out, to the load impedance of the speaker, you can get what's called uh, uh, a back EMF from the speaker actually driving the amplifier. And that can affect the, the response of the, uh, of the overall system. So in other words, uh, what you want to have uh, ideally, I think, is a very low source impedance, or at least that's the philosophy we use at NAD, is to have as low as possible a source impedance. And that allows it to drive any kind of loudspeaker with flat frequency response. So in that case, it's the loudspeaker that's determining what the frequency response is and not the amplifier. And I think this is an area where a lot of audiophiles say, well, you know, this speaker sounds really good on this, or this amplifier sounds really good on this speaker, but if I play it on this speaker, it wasn't as good. And, you know, that can be a lot of fun as an audiophile to pick those matchups and get the ones that work really well. But the other way of looking at it is if you have a really good low source impedance, then that matters much less, as does the cables connecting the amplifier to the speaker matter less. Because really what those uh, cables are is they, they form a network. They have a resistance, inductance, and capacitance, which is basically a filter. And the filter can interact with the impedance of the amplifier in such a way that we can change the frequency response of the signal. The other area that really makes a big difference is clipping behavior. So you want to have an amplifier that has very, very clean clipping and instant recovery. Because unless you've really got an amazingly powerful amplifier, you're probably going to get clipping at some point. Um, and if it's really clean and really well behaved, you probably won't even hear it if it's uh, just on, on peaks. If it's not well behaved, it can create uh, quite, a, quite a bad sound uh, that's not pleasant. When you go into clipping, the distortion really goes crazy. You know, you just get, uh, you know, the, the signal becomes almost 100% distortion and you get just all these uh, non-musical sounds coming out of the amplifier. So these are measurements. Uh, let me thank uh, John Atkinson from Stereophile because one thing about measurements is the way that the equipment that you've used and the test setup can vary a lot and can change the dis distortion measurement. Uh, if you've got a distortion analyzer on the bench with a power amplifier, if you take the lead from the distortion analyzer feeding the amplifier and move it, you'll see the distortion change. It becomes very, very sensitive at these very, very um, low distortion readings. So having a consistent setup is good. And I've got a few different amplifiers here that are all excellent amplifiers, but they have very, very different kind of signatures. So you can see this spectrum from, uh, this is from 50 hertz to one kilohertz. It's a one kilohertz tone. So you can see that over here is, that's the test tone. And then these are artifacts. Ideally, there'd be nothing there. Um, but as I said, this is a $500 amplifier we're looking at. And for a $500 amplifier, to have all of those artifacts below 100 dB is actually extremely good performance. Um, but you can see that there are quite a few little perturbances there. And um, that can make a difference too, because spiky noise will actually be much more offensive than uh, really smooth noise. And I'll show you how that looks different. So this is the M32. You could, this is the $4,000 NAD amplifier. And you can see here, it's a much cleaner spectrum. 
uh, everything is below 110 dB, so it's about 10 dB quieter, but it's also much smoother. So uh, it, this is an amplifier that is, you know, has been noted in reviews and by listeners as being exceptionally quiet. It's a very, very black, quiet background, and that smoothness in the response there is, uh, is very, very good. So while you could say that, well, gee, that's below 100, um, you know, it's already down 100 D minus 100 dB, or am I really going to hear minus 110 as a difference? And I would say the answer is uh, yes, you can, especially with good speakers and a good, good source. You can notice that difference. And the, the subjective uh, feeling of that is that there's just this incredibly black background and all the music emerges from complete silence and complete blackness. And you really do hear all the very, very fine details in the music uh, that really express the harmonics of the instruments uh, and the spatial cues in the recording. So it'll give you better imaging, uh, a, a cleaner, truer sound. This is another excellent amplifier. This is an Air EX-8. I think it's a 100 watt per channel amplifier. And um, Air has a different, it's, this is a solid state AV amplifier. Um, and in this case, they use, uh, uh, I believe they use no global negative feedback. So their philosophy is to try and get the best performance possible without using a lot of negative feedback. And that's, you know, we could do a whole seminar on negative feedback, but um, suffice it to say is, you can see it's also very, very clean. It's all also below 100 uh, decibels. Uh, it's a little bit more uh, spiky than, uh, than the M32 is, but still very clean. This is a uh, audio research amplifier. This is a very expensive monoblock, um, and I'm not picking on it uh, because it's an excellent performing amplifier, but just showing how uh, an amplifier uh, that has, you know, this is not going to sound as quiet as either the air or the NAD. You can see there's a fair amount of spikiness, and you can see that it's probably power supply related. Now, this is an amplifier that runs at very, very high voltages, so, you know, they're dealing with a lot more potential noise than you would be in uh, some of these more efficient solid state designs. As I mentioned, the IM distortion is a place where you can really hear uh, a very unmusical sound if you've got too much of it. And again, um, this is our $500 amplifier. And you can see that pretty much everything's below 90 dB, which is actually very, very good. It's, uh, that's you know, down in the, in the uh, uh, 0.01 range. Um, and you can see that there are some you know, a fair number of, uh, of uh, frequencies being produced there. Even though they're low in level, uh, there are quite a few of them. This is the M32. Remember, that's the DAC that can drive your speakers. And here you see the noise floor tilted, and that's because of the ultrasonic noise. So this is 20K here. This is a 19 and 20K signal. So you're seeing the out-of-band ultrasonic noise there tilt that graph up a little bit. Um, but again, we're very, very even uh, metronomic almost uh, uh, artifacts in that IM signature. Uh, that's the air, uh, and that's got a bit more... Uh, that's not quite as good. That's. Uh, Mostly everything's down below 80. Here's 80 here, so. Um, and again, it's got that more metronomic like the M32, but it's a little bit higher in level. Um, and then you've got the audio research here, which you can see is very, very clean. Um, so, you know, there are a few spikes up here around, well, it's got a couple here close by that are at minus 70, which is not that good, but Overall, it's a pretty quiet looking graph there. And um, I think if all of us sat down and listened to these four amplifiers, we would all say that they're pretty darn good uh, uh, and very, very clean sounding. 
So I, I haven't I haven't picked really bad amplifiers to show you, but I've picked all good high fidelity amplifiers to try and show that uh, even within the spec, a lot of these could all have the same spec or very similar spec, yet with you know the signature of that looks really different depending on how you uh, how you slice it. Um, this is harmonic distortion, and uh, you can see the audio research uh, in triode mode. So this is single-ended mode, which has a bit less power. Um, but you can see there's quite a bit of harmonic distortion. Um, still definitely high fidelity. It's below 1%. Um, but this would probably give the amplifier a slightly warm, you know, what we call the tube sound, which many of us really enjoy and like. But probably not quite as neutral and accurate as uh, some of the other designs. Uh, this is the air. Um, and again, here you can see um, the, uh, let's see what we're looking at here. Two ohms is the gray, that's the one on the top. So this is an amplifier that doesn't really like two ohms very much. Uh, but it's still point under 0.1%. Uh, and then it goes down very low when you get into the, the uh, for an 8 ohm. Uh, this is a C328, so you know, based on this, this is a very neutral sounding amplifier. This uses something we call a load invariant uh, amplifier design, so it does not change uh, response with different uh, uh, different impedances. And you can see it's you know not ultimately quite as clean, but still very clean and very uniform. And it is indeed a very neutral sounding amplifier. <clears throat> this is the frequency response of the 328. And uh, you can see it's really the same at all, all impedances. It's got a very nice uniform out to 20K and then, you know, minus 3D is out at about 50K. Um, this one right here is a little feature that we put on this less expensive amplifier, which we call base EQ. So that's done. Uh, we consider that many people buying an entry-level amp like this are probably going to use it with small bookshelf speakers. Uh, and this is an, uh, an EQ that's not a tone control. It's a, it is a tone control, but very specifically uh, designed. We center it on about 80 hertz, which is where the, the kick drum comes in in a lot of rock recordings. It gives a very nice, fattens up these little monitors and, uh, and gives them a, a, a fatter sound. We also cut it steeply below because you don't want to take that little four inch or five inch woofer and try to drive it at 20 hertz. You just get pure distortion and bottoming out. So, you know, that's a very specific thing. If you take the filter out, we're flat down to 10 hertz. This is the M32. This is the DAC that amplifies. And here you see something uh, a little bit different. Here we have on the output a. Um, uh, a reconstruction filter that filters out the sampling frequency in the class D amplifier. And this one here, that's left and right channel, the blue and the red, that's, we actually have a, a, a special circuit in there to linearize the top octave frequency response. So if it is set correctly, you will get this response at all impedances, but you do have to go in and set it. So you can see that uh, above about 6K, that filter starts to have an effect. Um, and so uh, you can get flat response at all those impedances uh, by just setting the speaker so setting on the, on the front panel of the air. This is the audio research. And um, what John does in his tests is he does uh, 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 you know, 8 ohms, 4 ohms, 2 ohms, and then he does a simulated speaker load. And you can see that this is really interacting with the speaker because the uh, output matching transformer gives this amplifier a fairly high output impedance closer to the, uh, to the speaker. So you can see, uh, now of course that's like plus or minus 1 dB, we're not talking uh, about a lot of variation there, but there is a little bit of uh, of wiggle in there. And the air actually exhibits a similar uh, effect because, again, they're not using negative feedback. The negative feedback could compensate for that uh, if that were part of the design. 
So those two amplifiers are going to be more fussy about what speaker they're matched with and mated with and maybe even what speaker cables you're using. They'll show more of an effect, they'll interact more with those, uh, those impedances of the speaker. So here's just a, a quick chart. You probably can't read it from your seat, but it's just showing the different price points. So uh, the 328 NAD is 550. The NAD M32 is 4,000. The Air is about 7,000. And the Audio Research is about 30,000. So even though there's a broad range of price here, um, the specs are all uh, closer than you might, might expect. But here's the thing about power. Another way to express it, and you know they tried to get this as a standard, but it never caught on, was dBW. And so that's actually, in some ways, more relates to what we hear. And what you'll notice is you know, between the 50-watt continuous and the 180 watt continuous, you've really only got about 5 dB of difference there. Um, and how does that relate into what we hear? Well, 3 dB is, you know, we can hear as, it's considered that 1 dB is the smaller increment that we can actually perceive. 3 dB, you can really hear the difference. Uh, so, you know, if you were saying, well, I'm trying to decide between this 180 watt NAD and this 100 watt air. Well, this has two and a half dB more power, potentially, which would be noticeable, but not much, barely noticeable. And if we're between the, the 180 watt NAD and the 140 watt audio research, uh, there again you can see it's, it's only a dB or so. So it's very, very small. And if you add into that the fact that we're normally only listening to these at for probably 10%, even when we got it cranked up, we're only using 10% of that continuous power. You know, it probably doesn't really translate into a big difference in how loud the amplifier will play. The more important thing is how much current can it deliver and will it give you that really extended tight bass response that, that you want. The other thing that's a little different here is uh, power consumption. So the 50 watt 328 there, that's a class D amplifier, analog class D. And you see it's only 16 watts uh, at idling. Um, the M32, the 180 watt class D is 37 watts at idling. The air, which is a, a solid state AV design, is 120 watts at idling. So you're, you're turning a lot more of your energy into heat there. And then of course the vacuum tube uh, audio research has 520 watts at idle. So you really, you've got a little space heater uh, in the corner of your room there uh, if you're using that amplifier. So, and again the damping factor is, is the relationship between the uh, rated impedance that you're driving and the internal impedance of the amplifier. This is actually one that's really hard to measure because you know, you're gonna have a piece of wire in the system and that's got resistance that uh, adds up onto the internal uh, resistance inside the amplifier.